It's been fun watching via social media and just stories about the fun things parents are doing with their kids for Christmas from acts of kindness, special events, school programs, baking. Although now I kind of question what some of you have gotten me, uh, where it's been. If you judged this time of year strictly by the culture, you would conclude that Christmas is all about happiness, laughter, and parties. The TV specials have bright lights and loud music. The ads on television are about people getting cars and other expensive gifts. December's to remember, right? There are songs about bells and Santa and so forth. Even the Grinch movies are made to have a happy ending. But behind all that, and sometimes below all that, the truth is, for many of us, there's a sense of melancholy that kind of hangs over this time of year like a, like a dark cloud. And we're ashamed to admit it or embarrassed to mention it. For too many reasons to mention or that we really, really want to mention, having a holly jolly Christmas is hard, if not impossible. Truth be told, some of us can even find ourselves resenting others who are dancing to the jingle bell rock and laughing all the way. As I was thinking about that, I came across an article just a couple of days ago from the Gospel Coalition website by a woman named Brittany Salmon titled, Celebrating Christmas with a Broken Heart. In it, she says this. A few years ago, I walked into the holiday season with fresh wounds, and I was blindsided by how a season I once found comforting brought additional pain. That calendar year had brought so much suffering. We lost loved ones. Our marriage had been through a rough season. Our adoption plans had been halted. My husband was in the middle of a career change, and we were walking through a family crisis. I'd even been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder from all the shock and change. Sin, death, and brokenness seemed ever-present, and the raw grief prevented me from celebrating the holidays like I used to. And maybe you make some slight changes to the details of that story, but that may be you. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> this Advent season, we've been looking at the names of Jesus foretold by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9 of his prophecy. Today we come to the fourth and final name or character trait or description of the child who shone and still shines his great light into the darkness of this world. Even the darkness that may be in your soul this morning. It's easy to be thankful and to rejoice when God brings seasons of abundance, but it can be a struggle to be grateful when He brings suffering, can't it? But Isaiah's prophecy speaks to us in all seasons of life, and maybe especially in seasons of suffering. So if that's you, these words might just be more powerful and meaningful than if life right now were holly and jolly. Again, Isaiah 2, beginning, chapter, Isaiah 9, beginning with verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burns them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness or increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So this morning we look at Prince of Peace. The title comes with a lot of misconceptions. It's not the Prince of Peace and Quiet. Chaos may still abound around us. He's still the Prince of Peace. He's not some diplomatic Prince of World Peace, like a UN ambassador. Just because there are wars does not mean he has let us down and he is not, in fact, still Prince of Peace. So I think it's important to know what the child is and how exactly he is the light in our dark world as Prince of Peace. So three critical words that have to be looked at and, and, and understood. And first being, of course, Prince. So when Isaiah tells us that the child will be a prince, it's not about him being charming, if I can use a Cinderella reference, but it's about him being a chief. See, the term prince is frankly more military-based than royalty-based. One of the earliest uses of this Hebrew word in the scriptures comes in Genesis chapter 21 where Abraham comes again, uh, up, uh, not against, but it meets a, another king named Abimelech. And this king Abimelech has with him what the scriptures tell us is his commander named Phicol. The, name, the word commander is the same word as prince in Isaiah 9. Earlier in Isaiah chapter 3, we read these words, beginning with verse 1. See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. This is the warning. This is, what's, this is impending if they don't repent. He's going to take supply and support, all the supplies of food, all the supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50, and the man of rank. That word captain is our word prince. In Isaiah 9, 6. It's a military term. So like the term mighty God, Prince of Peace describes the Messiah as one who is, an, who is a warrior and exerts his strength and fights to bring us peace. That's the word prince. Secondly, we need to understand peace. When Isaiah tells us that the child will be the Prince of Peace... It's not about the absence of violence. It's, it's, it's not the power of intimidation to force a ceasefire. But it's about the presence of wholeness or, or completeness, whatever word speaks to you. That's the Hebrew word shalom. It's one of the most, it's one of the deepest, multifaceted words in the Hebrew language. It's the idea of being complete and content and whole. Maybe the closest thing we have to understanding this in our New Testament is when, is when Jesus says that he came to bring us abundant life. It's that sense, it's that, it's that, it's that idea of, of it, 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 it fits, everything comes together, it, it completes. So call it inner peace or authentic joy, the light of Jesus sets things right by showing us the most important reality of being in harmony with God despite the chaos and the turmoil that may surround us. We can have peace, shalom, wholeness. Then the term government. We haven't really talked about that much in this series. The government, the increase of government will be on his shoulders. When Isaiah tells us that the greatness and the increase of the child's government will have no end. It's not about a political system, but it's a, about a spiritual reign. That probably doesn't surprise us. So, now you can probably begin to understand why, why the people of Israel were expecting a Messiah that would be, though, a political, military leader. 
When they heard terms like mighty God and prince of peace, they thought of a commander who would drive out the enemy and reestablish Israel to its place of prominence. And it's not that God doesn't want that. It will come in time. But without attacking the spiritual enemy first, all you're left with is a bunch of nonviolent lost souls. Again, God is thinking eternally, more than just about a temporary ceasefire. So the promise is that the child will be called Prince of Peace because every single person longs for deep, personal, everlasting peace or shalom. And the good news this morning is that Jesus is fighting for that in your life at this very moment. So this child, the son who is given to us, illuminates our world, Isaiah says, First, by being our wonderful counselor or what we've called the divine counsel. Remember, it, it, it's interesting as you look back in Jesus' life, he was not just a lecturer. It, it was life on life how he taught. Yes, there were those moments where he spoke to the crowds, but the rest of what we have is just this life on life connection with people. He's our divine counsel. He's mighty God. He's our divine warrior. We looked at how he is, he is a fierce warrior as he attacks our enemy, but he's a tender protector of those who are in his care. Last week we looked at everlasting Father, that, that, that Jesus is our divine provider, compassionate, forgiving, loving. Remember, from everlasting to everlasting, without end. This week, again, Prince of Peace, Jesus is our divine Savior. And to help us understand this, I want today to go to Isaiah chapter 61, just the first three verses. In that article I mentioned earlier about Christmas for the brokenhearted, the author suggests some practical um, steps to take if, if during this Christmas season you are suffering emotionally. And, and one of those steps she offered was to surround yourself with truth. That's pretty good. Surround yourself with truth. So focus less on fluff and flash and more on the good news or the gospel. In her words, truth that gives room for both pain and joy to sit together in the light of the gospel. That's what Isaiah 61 offers. It's truth that takes in our joy while acknowledging the reality of suffering. The first verse of this chapter is so full of hope precisely because it's honest about our human condition. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor or afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. The poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners. What could be more welcome than, to these than good news? And that's precisely what Jesus came to preach and proclaim. Isaiah reminds us of Jesus' light with first as Jesus proclaimed good news of restoration. Restoration for the hurting. Restoration for the distressed. Restoration for the hopeless. It's one of the great promises of the shepherd, isn't it? it takes us back to the, the passage that many of us memorized when we were kids. Psalm 23, verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He brings life to that which is dying in us. That's peace with God. You remember when John the Baptist was imprisoned 
And he sees the end, that, that it's not going to end well with him physically. He's going to die. He sends some of his followers to Jesus to just kind of triple check. Are you the one that was promised? Just, he just wants that reassurance. And we read these words in Matthew chapter 11. The response that Jesus sends back to John. In Matthew 11, verse 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Again, that word can mean afflicted. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Restoring people, to, restoring people to physical health, restoring people in, 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 in light of all their suffering was a sign that Jesus could restore our souls and our spirits. If, if he could make the lame walk, if he, could, if he could raise the dead, then he can do something in my spirit as well. And so that's why in, in Mark chapter 2, when some friends brought a paralyzed friend of theirs... Maybe he fell, broke a spine. We don't know, but this man cannot move. And, and friends, bring him to Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to him as they lowered him through the, the thatched roof? Your sins are forgiven. He didn't say immediately get up and walk. He said your sins are forgiven. Because if a man can, can heal a paralytic, he can heal their, his soul. And So we read later in chapter 2 of Mark. The, the response of Jesus, beginning with verse 8. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what the Pharisees were thinking. Why were they, they were thinking he's blaspheming. He, no one can forgive sins but God. He knows what they're thinking. He said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. If Jesus can do that, he can also forgive our soul's diseases. So we may not have a physical affliction right now, although the older we get, the more afflictions tend to find us. But we're, we are all afflicted with sin. Its effects can break us, kind of hold us captive, zap all the joy out of living. And the good news this morning is that Jesus provides healing, freedom, and release. Because if he can restore a paralyzed man's body so that he can walk, he can defeat the sting of death in our soul. Jesus proclaims this good news to us, which is also, secondly, good news of justice. Back to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2. He's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, when Isaiah speaks of the year of the Lord's favor, he's, he's not talking about a 365-day time span, and, and the day of vengeance isn't just this 24-hour period. He's talking about a new era of God's blessing when his, his covenant is renewed and the wicked are going to be punished. In other words... Life will work out the way we think it should work out. It's similar to what he said in Isaiah 34, verse 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution, to uphold Zion's cause. This Paul, Paul speaks of this very directly in Acts 17 to the, to the wise sage philosophers in Athens. In, in Acts 17... Paul says, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. 
He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. It's no secret. Evil will not win in the end. And it's important for us to know. Because for as long as man has existed, as long as people of God have been in relationship with him, we have struggled with two fundamental questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? And why do good things happen to bad people? If you remember I, uh, Psalm 73 the writer of that psalm said, my, I, my foot almost slipped. That, that's the vernacular of saying, I almost lost faith. Because all I could see were wicked people having a great time and living as though they had not a care in the world. Why is that? What's just about that? What's good about that? What is right about that? In the Old Testament, there's another prophet named Habakkuk. It's one of those books that... We don't know how to say his name, so we just don't read his book. But in Habakkuk, <laughs> he asked right off the bat, How long, Lord? How long do I have to look at evil winning? Why is it that evil is triumphing in this world? God responds, but Isaiah or Habakkuk comes, comes right back. How long? God answers in chapter 2, verse 3, If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So Jesus' proclamation is both a warning to those living in sin and a comfort to those who mourn over all the sin that we see. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, who have to live in it, who have to experience it. It's coming. It will not delay. Wait for it. By the way, Rather than resenting the wicked, maybe the right approach is to compassionately approach them with the gospel. Just saying. Thirdly, Jesus is our divine Savior because he also proclaims good news of blessing. Good news to proclaim to the poor, good news to proclaim about his justice, Good news to proclaim about his blessing. Verse 3, providing those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That, that notion of being covered in ashes is, is just the ultimate sign of, 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 of sorrow, of, 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 of hurt, of anguish, of pain. And instead of those, a crown of beauty... The oil of joy instead of mourning? The, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair? They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Just when it looks like evil is going to win, just when it looks like good people just don't have a chance, when they're to be pitied more than anyone else, Jesus says, no, that, there's good news. God's looking at all of this, folks, through the lens of eternity, not the temporary. And through the lens of eternity, what he sees are mighty oak trees called righteous. How? How do they get? Because, remember the very first psalm, Psalm chapter 1, they're planted by... By streams of righteousness. They're fed by the goodness of God. And so they last. And they are, they're, they're as, as mighty as, as a sequoia or whatever, whatever tree you think of. They, they last. They are permanent. They are eternal. That's the blessing that we enjoy through the good news. So I understand 
because I've been there, that this may be a season not of excitement and abundance. If it is, that's great. Rejoice in it. Don't apologize for it. Thank God for it. But if it's not, if it's a season of emotional and spiritual pain, understand that's okay too. Don't apologize for it. Don't be ashamed of it or embarrassed by it. It's okay. You're looking at this time of year through a lens where suffering puts sentiment in its right place. To you, a son is given. A child has been born for you. The Prince of Peace rules and reigns and brings healing to the brokenhearted. Let's pray. Father, as we approach you as a community this morning, there are as many different stories as there are people here. But you're the author of all of it. And for some, this is a season of, of victory, of abundance, of of experiencing in unique ways your blessings. And praise you for that, God. We give you praise for that. It doesn't come from our hand, it comes from yours. And for others this morning, the truth is, it's hard. There are things in our lives that would try to take our joy away, would steal our victory, turn our gaze away from you. And I pray this morning, God, especially for those who are experiencing that, that the good news that you proclaim is for them. Though, though now there may be a period of affliction, of brokenheartedness, of, of captivity, the child, the Prince of Peace, is fighting to restore those as well. And so God, surround us with your truth. Show us the way everlasting. Have compassion on us as, your, as the, our everlasting Father. Counsel us with your truth. Fight the enemy for us. And be tender toward us. I pray this in his name. Amen.